Thank you everyone for uh, your virtual presence, um, which I think is the uh, one of the few ways of to communicate with people these days. Um, today I wanted to talk about our our recent results on learning theory. Uh, this is an ongoing work which we have, we have been working with uh, uh, Jising and Wojtek. Uh, Jising is a postdoc here at the uh, Center for Science of Information. And uh, we have been working on this uh, problem uh, about 10 months. And uh, there are some interesting results, uh, which I'm going to briefly um, go over them. And there are many questions that needs to be answered. Um, okay. okay, good. So as you know, um, now with the advances in technology, we are able to process uh, large data sets and we can have many inferences from the data sets. But one of the main challenges that uh, this is needs to be addressed is when the data, data set has so many features. So basically the dimension of this space is very high and this raises an important uh, challenges, especially in medical applications, where we have tens of thousands of uh, features, but we don't have enough samples so that we can get an accurate estimations or inference uh, from the data. And uh, therefore, this raises uh, uh, important uh, motivations for feature selection. Where the idea is that, especially in medical applications, the idea is that uh, originally we have a, a data set with a large number of features where each feature represents a medical, app, medical measurements that has been done on a patient. And the idea is to only select a few uh, uh, features out of the total features and Hopefully, by training a learning algorithm on that small subset, we will be able to get a good prediction of the uh, whatever the goal is. For instance, if you want to estimate uh, cancer uh, using the data, then uh, this feature selection is to be used. And uh, this is also uh, important to do feature selection because we would like to have interpretable um, notion of the data. We don't want just uh, to do a dimension reduction where we lost track of the features. Of course, this is uh, uh, in contradicts with theoretical results, especially data processing inequality, which states that we lose information if we uh, try to remove the features from the data. But practically it has been useful in reducing the running time, in uh, uh, also reducing the prediction error for learning algorithms, and also for medical applications, reducing the cost. So with that motivation, um, there have been many works in feature selection here. At Can least. I ask a question, Mohsen? Yes, please. Um, so what is the goal here? Is it to find the most discriminative features or is, is it to find the most dominant feature? So, so the point is, uh, for example, if you take a rank one approximation of the matrix, that is the least discriminative, but the most descriptive set of features. Uh, whereas if you filter out the high ranks and, and take some middle ranks, you would probably get the most discriminative features, but not the most descriptive features. So what do you want? Uh, I will explain it clearly in the uh, next few slides, but the, uh, the goal is that I'm gonna define a loss function and I'm gonna, this is a, this is a uh, uh, supervised version of the problem where I want to minimize that loss function by looking on the, at the subset of features. So it would be most relevant uh, subsets of features. And I'm not talking about, on, not only about uh, single variable features, but subsets of features together. Uh, so I will talk about it in precise way and in a, in a coming slides. So yeah, as you know, there are many um, uh, feature selection applications and methods uh, that they define the sort of different kind of measures and um, they have different uh, uh, applications on the problem. So uh, with this motivation now, 
uh, for the sake of presentation, I'm gonna clearly define what the problem is. So we're gonna start with the features uh, that lives in a d-dimensional Euclidean space. And uh, let's assume that they, there's a statistics for the data that is represented by a joint distribution TXY. And we have a training data set, uh, which is assumed to be IID samples of the same distribution TXY. We have N samples. We do the feature selection um, based on the training samples. And let's assume that K features are selected, J1 up to JK. There's a learning algorithm that is trained on those uh, uh, feature subsets and produces a predictor G. Now with that set, we also have a loss function as for the performance, where is a function L from Y to Y and to R. And we can have the zero one loss function, which is useful for prediction. And we have the square loss function, which is also useful for uh, regression problems. And as a risk of a classifier, we take the expectation of this loss and uh, we have expected loss. Therefore, for um, zero one loss function, we have misclassification error and we have mean square error as for regression problems. Now with that formulation, uh, we can define the feature selection problem as follows. Suppose we are fixing a parameter K and we want to select K features out of D features. Uh, with that, uh, then we need to have this optimization problem. This is an ideal setting, everything is known. And uh, this is the optimal loss that we can get as a function of K, where the first minimization is taken over all feature subsets of size at most K, and then the second uh, minimization is taken over all uh, uh, prediction function that's supported on RK. And we are calculating the loss of those predictors. So clearly this loss function is the optimal loss that we can get when we select K features. So it's a function of K and it's a function of also the joint distributions. Now, uh, with that said, um, clearly we cannot calculate directly this optimization problem. First, because we don't have access to the statistics of the data and also that this optimization is very computationally expensive. So we need an intermediate uh, measure uh, to um, score each feature subsets, which is both computationally efficient and theoretically justified. So with that, then uh, we can formulate the feature selection problem as follows. It's uh, the following minimization problem. Where here I have M, M is my measure that we design and TK is the collection of the feature subsets that we are gonna take the minimization over that more or less represents the action of the search algorithm and M is the measure that is going to be used. And then we have J hat M, which is the, uh, the select, represents the selected feature, which of course depends on the training samples. So with this setup, we can uh, write uh, some of the unknown uh, feature selection measures for instance, FS score or mutual information or Pearson correlation and these kind of features. And uh, so uh, with that, now the objective is in this work is to find a measure M and uh, find a um, learning, design a learning algorithm that uh, uh, achieves the optimal uh, selected feature. For that, we, uh, uh, we develop a Fourier-based framework to analyze the loss function. We try to use the framework to analyze the loss function and hopefully try to uh, characterize what the optimum feature subset is. That for the case where the statistics is known, for the uh, practical, applications when to have a Fourier-based criteria to measure feature subsets and ultimately a learning algorithm that uh, hopefully achieves the optimal loss. Okay, for that, then I need to talk about the Fourier expansion. Um, 
this is a little bit different from the standard free expansion where the functions are decomposed in terms of the cosine and sine functions. This is a, the uh, Fourier uh, expansion developed for Boolean functions. And it's a well-known result. And it has many, many applications um, in noise sensitivity for functions, cryptography, quantum computing, and other applications. Uh, you, may, uh, you may be aware of, aware of this. So I'm just for the sake of uh, presentation, I'm going to go over this framework. Uh, there are some related works uh, on Fourier expansion, uh, mainly O'Donnell work, uh, and also some results on uh, learning uh, K-Junta functions, which are basically a fun set of functions who are depends only on K variables. And uh, we have also more general decompositions, um, namely hofting sobel decompositions, where they use conditional expectation as a measure to decompose a function. And we have this well-known result of uh, Witsenhausen in information theory, which also characterizes the uh, maximal correlation. So um, here is a brief overview of uh, the concepts, uh, basic concepts for Fourier expansions. Um, First, we're gonna talk about binary features. By binary features, I mean plus one and minus one instead of zero one. We are gonna use plus one and minus one. And it turns out that this is uh, make the analysis easier uh, when we do a plus one and minus one. And we also have this space of functions, uh, bounded real valued functions uh, on this space. So uh, this function is a space. We can think of it as a Hilbert space or a vector space. Therefore, we have inner product. It's basically for any f and g, the inner product is basically defined by this summation, where x ranges over all uh, inputs, possible inputs. In this space, then we have uh, special classes of uh, parity functions, where if s here is a subset of features, then a parity function is basically this monomial function. Is basically the uh, this product. So it turns out that we can take any function on this space and write it as a linear combination of the parities. And these fs's are unique uh, coefficients, and they're called the Fourier coefficients. And here s is ranges over all subsets of uh, uh, the set one to d. So we have two raised to power d number of uh, subsets, and then this is the uh, Fourier decomposition. And um, as for the Fourier coefficients, uh, they're calculated according to this inner product, which is basically this summation. Okay. So this result basically means that parities in this space form an orthonormal basis for this space of functions. Now, here is, a, here is an example. So let's take a look at the R function on two bits. And by two bits, I mean the plus one and minus one bits. And you can see the, uh, uh, can you see the, uh, the logic table? Okay, okay, because I can't see it because of the, yeah. So um, we have this logic table for R function. And then let's look at the parities. Here the dimension is two, so we have four parities uh, from the empty set element one, element two, and element one, two. We can calculate the Fourier coefficients. Uh, for the first Fourier coefficient, we have FMT, which is basically the average of R function, and it is one half. And similarly, we can calculate other Fourier coefficients. And then we have the Fourier expansion for R function, which is this uh, polynomial function. And you can easily check that the right hand side, if we put any, uh, the right hand side gives us the logic table above. And um, so if we put any, for instance, if you put minus one and one gives us one. So this is a Fourier expansion uh, for Boolean functions. But in the feature selection problem, we have a distribution on the features. So we need to introduce the notion of the probability distribution on the Fourier expansion. 
Uh, this is also a well-known result called the p-bias Fourier expansion. And the idea is that, uh, let's assume that the features are IID for the moment. And so we have a non-uniform distribution and minus one and one. So, and the feature, each feature has this bias P and then we still have the same space of the functions, but the inner product now is the expectation between F and G. And then we have also parities which are centralized and normalized, where here mu is basically the mean of the expectation of the feature and sigma is the standard deviation. And uh, we have also this result that uh, these parities form an orthonormal basis, meaning that if I take two parities, uh, psi s and psi t for different subsets s and t, then the inner product is zero. And if uh, t is equal to s, then the inner product is one. And I can write the, uh, the Fourier expansion for any function as this linear uh, combination. And then we have the Fourier, uh, the p bias Fourier coefficients. The only difference with the regular one is that now that we are taking the expectation, the inner product is the expectation. If you look at the R function, now if you take p equals to one half, we get the previous uh, Fourier uh, expansion decomposition. But let's say if we take p point one, we get a different expansion in terms of the parities. And um, it's not difficult to check that. The two functions on the right-hand side, they're equal to each other, but they're in different uh, form now. So this, is, this was for uh, Fourier expansion. Now we are going to build up on this Fourier expansion and use it for the feature selection problem. But for the sake of presentation, I am going to assume some simplifying assumptions. The first assumption is that we assume that features um, are binary features, plus one and minus one. And let's assume they are IID. Uh, later on, I'm going to relax these conditions. And further, we assume that uh, the label is a function of x. So when the feature, meaning that the, when the uh, feature values are fixed, there is no randomness in Y in the label. And we are interested in binary classification with zero one loss function. And in this setup, then the classifies risk is basically the misclassification probability. So the optimal feature selection uh, that I talked about now becomes this optimization problem, where the, now the loss function is the probability of error. But uh, even in the ideal setting, if that we have access to a statistics of the data, this is a very complicated optimization problem because the search space uh, grows doubly exponential with k and is also uh, grows d by k when, when uh, d is large. So which means that we need to uh, uh, find a measure, a relevant measure, instead of this optimization problem. But before that, we're going to use the Fourier expansion method to have a closed form expression for P, P or PTK, a closed form expression for the optimal feature subset and the optimal classifier. Of course, this is in the ideal setting. Then we're going to build up on that and use it for the agnostic settings where we are only have access to a training set. And basically, we're gonna try to uh, characterize a measure M for feature selection that is based on the Fourier expansion. So with that, I'm gonna start with the uh, with characterizing this uh, optimal feature sub selection problem. For that, we need uh, one more definition. So if if we are given a function f, then we can write its Fourier expansion. But now if we take, uh, instead of ranging over all subsets of elements one to d, if we uh, restrict ourselves to subsets of the collection of subsets of s, which are only a subset of j, here j is fixed. 
then we get a part of the Fourier expansion of f. And this is called uh, a projection of, this represents uh, a projection of this labeling function that uh, measures the dependency of the labeling on feature subset j. So uh, if, if I take j to be the whole set one to d, then I uh, get the, uh, the whole labeling function. Then with this definition, we have this result, which basically means that in the ideal setting, the optimal classifier and optimal uh, loss for the parameter k is expressed as this optimization problem. Where the maximization is taken over all feature subsets of size k. And the expression, the objective function is the norm one of this projection function. And if J star is the uh, subset that max that optimizes this uh, problem, then the optimal classifier is just the sign of this uh, projection function. So by looking at this optimization problem, now it's clear that this norm one of this projection is a good measure. It's basically the optimal measure that we can use for feature selection problem. So the idea now is to have an empirical estimate of this quantity. And this is what I'm gonna talk about next. But before that, is there any question? Okay. So um, that gives us the one norm measure now. So the idea now is that we're gonna first start with empirical mean and standard deviation of the features. They're calculated as usual. And then we're gonna have empirical parities, which are basically the same monomials, but we have uh, the empirical mean and empirical uh, standard deviation on that. Then we have this estimation for Fourier coefficients, which is the empirical estimation of the Fourier coefficient for subset S, so basically this average. So here Xi and Yi's are the training samples. And then later on, we combine all these together and we have a projection function. And as for the norm measure, um, we can calculate the norm empirically. But uh, here notice that we are using some extra term. Uh, we are subtracting this extra term to make sure that this measure is unbiased. So we now, now we have this measure M1 of J that, um, is an approximation to norm one. And uh, through some large deviation analysis, we can show that that's a good approximation if we have enough uh, number of samples. And finally, we get the consistency of this measure. And by consistency, I mean this. Suppose if you're using the measure that I was talking about, this M1, and suppose we were doing exhaustive search over all feature subsets of size k, then we have this j hat of m. And let's look at this probability of j, meaning that if we fix a feature subset, what is the uh, minimum probability of error, minimum misclassification probability that we can get? That's this optimization problem where we are searching over all j's. And that's a function of this subset. So if I put this optimum feature subset, then I get the optimum loss function. And for this feature selection problem, I have this quantity PJ hat. I wanted to compare these two. And this is the result that we have. So which basically implies that these two quantities are close to each other with high probability, given that we have enough number of uh, training samples. So this basically means that uh, the features, if I use this measure, the feature that I'm gonna select has, gives me the same probability of error as the optimal feature subset. It's not necessarily equal to that, but it gives me the same probability of error. So um, this was for classification problem. We can use it for a square loss function. There we can show that instead of one norm, we need to go to two norm. And in two norm, uh, the uh, mathematics becomes easier because we're gonna have from partial inequality, the two norm simply becomes 
the sum of the square of the Fourier coefficients. Therefore, we can have M2 as the measure, which basically we estimate the Fourier coefficients, and then we calculate this sum. And then we can show that this also, this M2 minimizes the square loss function. So this was for the ideal case, uh, where we assume that features are IID, uh, uh, and the label was, is, was a, a function of the features. Now we need to have two extensions to make it practical. One is um, uh, we need the Fourier expansion for correlated features. Where here we assume that, let's assume that features are arbitrarily distributed. Uh, that we can have redundant features, uh, we can have uh, irrelevant features and all sorts of things. So for that, we recently uh, developed uh, uh, a kind of a Fourier expansions for functions where functions of correlated random variables and arbitrary random variables. And the other extension we need is that uh, we have randomness in Y. So Y, instead of being a function of the features, it is coming from a stochastic mapping from the features. And for that, we also recently developed some kind of a Fourier expansion for stochastic mappings. So having these two together, now we can use the Fourier expansion in real world applications. But there is one more challenge need to be addressed. And that is the exhaustive search over all feature subset is an NP-hard problem. We can't do exhaustive search. And for that, uh, we developed some kind of uh, a fixed depth search. And here's the uh, rough idea and the algorithm. So now the idea is that, so instead of doing the exhaustive search, we are going to limit our, the depths of our search. So let's take a parameter T. T can be very small, let's take it two. And then we're gonna rank all two variable feature subsets. And based on this measure, either M1 or either M2. And then, uh, we rank them from the largest to the smallest uh, in terms of the measure. And then we take the union of those uh, uh, features with the highest rank. We continue taking the union so that we get K features. And this is where we stop. And that's gonna give us a J hat, uh, which is a feature subset. Of course, this is not gonna give us the optimal result because we are not doing exhaustive search but it gives relatively good result, even for very small depths. And I should note that here that if it's fixed T to B1, we get the regular uh, ranking methods where we rank the features. So uh, we test this on a number of uh, training data sets, and this is still an ongoing, so we are, we are uh, testing this uh, algorithm on uh, different, different data sets. And uh, these two data sets in this slides are synthetic data. So the first one is uh, more or less like an ideal case. Uh, so we have IID features, binary IID features that are generated by bias P, which is taken to be 0.3. And then we generated the labeling function randomly through some airline distribution. Here we put these parameters. The dimension is 12. And K is four, meaning that we want to select four features out of 12 features. And we have 2,500 samples. We take only depths to search, the parameter T now is two. And here are the results. And you can see that uh, we compare that with uh, the F value score measure and the mutual information. And we compared it with different, different algorithms like random forest, SVM, linear classifier, k-nearest neighbors. And you can see that uh, it gives us a promising result comparing to those two. And we also tried this on random hypercube. Uh, random hypercube, as you know, is, uh, is that we have a, a high dimensional hypercube and we have normal uh, distribution on each vertices. So we do class, we wanted to do binary classification on that. And for that, then we take the dimension to, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, for that, then we take the dimension to be 13. 
and we want to select four features out of 13 and with the search to uh, depths to search and here are the results again so you can see that it gives improvements even on this and note that here uh, these are uh, primitive uh, algorithms that we are using meaning that we are not doing these are uh, the algorithms that are designed for the ideal case and uh, be, since we recently developed this uh, Fourier expansion for correlated features, uh, we're going to have an algorithm that also gives improvements over this recent algorithm. So this result is going to be improved further. And, um, and also, I should mention here that for the hypercube uh, data, although the algorithm is developed for binary features, but for hypercube, I have real valued feature and it works well even for real valued features. Uh, here also, we try two real value data set. One is the heart disease UCI, where the dimension is 13. And this is a, a data set that used to you know, detect heart disease in patients. And we only want to select two features out of 13 features. And we have only 300 samples, and here are the results that we, uh, we give improvements over those features. The other one is the MNIST. For MNIST, um, we observe some interesting uh, observations, some interesting results. So we, we just as a benchmark, uh, we picked the MNIST data set, and we said that uh, let's uh, assume we want to select a very small number of features. Let's take four features out of uh, 674 features and see what's, what are the results that we're gonna get. And this is, this is the result we, that we got, that it, is, it shows an improvement. And the other one is that we select K to be 10. And uh, one other thing that recently we did was MNIST with PCA. So we said that, okay, let's, take, let's apply PCA first on MNIST to reduce the dimension to 331, and let's redo the uh, feature selection problems. And in, okay, sorry. And interestingly, what we saw is that um, by only selecting 20 features, uh, we get a very good accuracy of 95%. Um, so it's, 20, dimension is reduced to 20 from uh, 664 and gives us a very good uh, uh, accuracy of testing. So these are the um, a very few data sets that they're trying. So we are still trying uh, this algorithm on different, different data sets and different problems. So these are, uh, this was a brief overview of what the results that recently we had. Yes. And that I uh, conclude this talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mohsen. Uh, are there any questions for Mohsen? Go ahead and you can just press down your space bar and ask. So I'll have to ask a few questions, Mohsen. Uh, to me, the more interesting part was, uh, yes, the analysis is interesting, but I, I come from a, a space where, you know, we'd like to solve the problem. So, so to me, that heuristic on, uh, slide 25, I believe, is is really the more uh, the more interesting part of of this. this uh, no, no, no. The, 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 you had a greedy heuristic. The, the uh, you know you take the pairs and you take unions and uh, there oh, you this go. seven, I believe. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So I, I can see how this would work in the IID case, but in the case of correlated attributes or correlated features, which really is a more interesting thing yes um how does this this uh, heuristic work because what how do you filter out correlates uh, well that's a very interesting question and this is actually the result that we recently um, came up with and if you look at the line one in the algorithm it says perform the orthogonalization procedure um so we came up with the orthogonalization method that deals with correlated random variable, correlated features. Um, so the, we have uh, some sort of 
um, so we have a package of three um, three tools. One is used for unsupervised feature selection. That is the orthogonalization that I didn't have time to talk about it in this presentation. But the rough idea is that we, we're gonna use the Fourier representation, the parity functions. And we use that and we, we saw that we can, we, if we do some sort of a Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization on that, then it, it removes the, all the redundant features. By redundant features, I mean that a feature that is a linear combination of the other features, like PCA. Just to be sure, Mosin, this orthogonalization is the orthogonalization of the coefficients of the Fourier expansion, or is it just orthogonalization of the raw data? Orthogonalization of uh, the kind of orthogonalization of the raw data. Yes. Yes. It's it's an unsupervised uh, orthogonalization, basically. So what scares me about this is this, I mean, I, I, if you use something like Gram-Schmidt or, or any other kind of orthogonalization, the error measures are all global. So what, what will happen is that you get these large linear combinations up top because they're trying to, to minimize some global measure. But for many problems that we look to solve, the, the discriminators, what really what you're trying to find are, are, are the most, with respect to classification, the most discriminating features. Yes. Discriminating features tend to be local, not global. Uh, so if I gave you a, a, a matrix in 10,000 dimensions, your first few, think of them as singular vectors, will all be some core signal. And they may have nothing to do with the true discriminators, which will be somewhere down in, in some lower uh, singular value, but then they're orthogonalized out, so you don't have the interpretability. You, you have random minus ones and plus ones all over. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, well, the thing is that uh, actually this orthogonalization captures those. This is the the thing is that um, uh, it's it's this this won't uh, mixes the data. This performs some kind of measures uh, on each on each feature and ranks them from the most discriminative to least discriminative. And of course, those of course those who are on the very top of the matrix who are linear combination of the most discriminative features, they're gonna be vanished by this orthogonalization method. And, and the notion of most discriminative is your Fourier curve? Is, um, it depends on the Fourier coefficient. It has it. Yes, it depends on the Fourier coefficient as well. It has. Um, uh, it it basically captures a variance. It, so it requires some. I have to present some kind of uh, mathematical result. You can show that it captures the conditional variance of uh, the label condition on the features. So meaning that's, uh, yes. So, uh, and also the conditional variance of a feature condition on other features. So if the feature is a linear combination, then it will, the conditional variance becomes zero. So, uh, so on and so forth. And, and uh, similar to more, not very similar, but uh, kind of the idea is that in PCA, we are sorting the variances of the um, IN vectors from the most uh, informative to least informative. Here is the idea is almost the same, but we are not mixing the data. We are doing feature selection. We are not doing dimension reduction. And that's one advantage of this work. And also that we can have a single variable, uh, you know, measure to measure the, how discriminated this uh, feature is or how redundant a feature is or how relevant a feature is yes and yeah, that, that's uh, very nice Marcin. i i you know, I, I'll, you know you and i can talk at much greater length we have some problems which have to do with the taking people's uh, mris and then doing a whole bunch of things with it for example uh, you know there are mris where they're doing motor tasks or emotion tasks or or, or cognition tasks and, and then we're trying to find out specific parts of the brain, which are the features that are, are actually the connect, co-firings are the features 
which are most implicated in these things. And then we have other data sets where, you know, some MRIs are for people who have Alzheimer's and some that don't. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out exactly what features of the brain or, or the connectome are, are strongly correlated with, uh, with these. Uh, we, we, we can, I, I don't want to take everybody else's time. We, we can set up a time and we can have this conversation later. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. And especially our, our main interest was in medical applications where feature selection is important. And actually, um, we tried this orthogonalization method on uh, some well-known uh, medical applications, such as um, the breast cancer uh, data set on UCI. And we know that uh, from the data that we know that, uh, if I recall it correctly, there were 30, 32 features out of each. It is well known that two or three are uh, the most uh, relevant one. If you take those two or three, then you get a very good accuracy, 95% and things like that. So as a benchmark, we wanted to test this orthogonalization method. And we did that and we realized that it actually captures uh, captures the discriminated most relevant features. And yeah, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, uh, it, I, the, the, the UCI data set is what it is. Those are toys. So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited that we can apply this to something real and, and, and you know, maybe get some real results. So I'll, we can chat later. Yes, definitely, definitely. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, so uh, the problems that you uh, showed mostly are of a uh, very low dimension, like 12 and you kind of select four and uh, the data set is huge, like thousand or 2000. But uh, kind of realistic was your UCI data where you have limited number of uh, samples, uh, three, yes, yeah, uh, three, 303 is also, it's a, it's a pretty large number, I would say, uh, with 13 dimension and reducing it to two. So how do you think your method scales with the dimension of the problem? You have uh, the dimension increases, but your data set decreases, which is most case in, uh, like one of the medical studies you see. You mean that the parameter N is small and but D is large? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question, yes. Um, so um, the current method that we have with the, uh, so I have to talk about what kind of search algorithm we are going to use. This current search algorithm, which is a fixed step search algorithm, uh, the complexity of this algorithm grows by d raised to power t. So for d equal to 2, it raised d squared. So as for the accuracy, uh, I'm not sure if I have the, uh, uh, the exact calculations, but the accuracy uh, more or less requires n to be log of d, but these are guaranteed results, uh, right? Uh, so it says that if, if the number of samples is this, we guarantee more or less optimality. If it is smaller, um, theoretically we can't say much about the data. We can't provide any guaranteed results, but we have test results which are useful for these cases. And uh, of course, for large data sets, uh, we can, there are, there are other methods of search algorithms that you can implement on these data sets. We can have a gradient descent uh, search algorithm with Fourier uh, measure uh, to get better results, yes. So, uh, so your uh, 0.72 in this slide is your prediction accuracy? Yes. So, so, so if you draw, so is the, for medical studies, uh, I think it's slightly on the lower side because you once you draw AUC curve for binary classification, you would expect something towards 0 0.8 or 0.9. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah uh, this point, is a benchmark. 0.8 is too much, so 0 0.7, 0 0.8, so. Uh, this, this was just a benchmark. Because here we get to two, right. meaning that we're only looking at two features. Right. And, uh, but of course, if we increase K, we get higher accuracy. And uh, um, I unfortunately we don't have it at this moment. We are we are working on this is an ongoing work, so we are still working on that. But 
as I mentioned before, for the breast cancer data set, uh, we test the data with k equal to 4 and gives us um, uh, around 90, 95 percent accuracy. Yeah, because I, I've uh, worked with a few of the medical data set a few years ago where even though we have thousands of uh, data points, the accuracy, once you draw AUC curve, the maximum you can go is up to 0.75 or something. Mm -hmm. That's the maximum you can go up to. Mm -hmm. So with, uh, with very small sample size, your accuracy is still low. So I'm just curious how it would scale up to a very high uh, dimensional problems. Um, yes. Yes, but yeah, for, for very high dimensional data sets. Um, so here, here I think uh, you can show that this is not, yeah, theoretically this is not enough number of training samples. And of course, it statistically doesn't give you, you, you cannot get, uh, get a very good accuracy by that small number of samples, right? For large data sets, especially in medical applications, one thing we can do is, we can do a sort of um, uh, removing redundant features first, and then we can do the optimization, the feature selection afterward. So like PCA, um, some kind of portabilization method for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Mosin, for the presentation. Did you have a, did you have a